Scott, in trying to understand the nature of time, how can complexity theory help? Okay, so um, I think that complexity theory can help uh, uh, illuminate what are the differences between space and time. So uh, uh, people often like to say, well, you know, Albert Einstein proved that space and time are identical, something like that. The thing is that that's not actually true. Even within uh, the theory of relativity, time is treated differently than the three space dimensions. Okay, and uh, uh, to a computer scientist, you know, the big overriding difference between the two is that uh, you can reuse space. Okay, you can keep, you know, reusing the same uh, uh, um, parts of space over and over again. You can put some information there. You can rewrite it later. But you know, unfortunately for all of us, you don't get to reuse time. Okay, once it's gone, it's you know, it seems gone forever. Okay, and uh, you know, within computational complexity theory, uh, this difference shows up as a, a fundamental conjecture, which is called. Uh, P not equal to P space conjecture. I apologize for the, <laughs> the names we give all these things. The physicists have much better names for things. Quark, black hole, you know, we're stuck with P and P space. But uh, uh, P is a, a polynomial time. This means basically the class of all the problems that a conventional computer could solve using a reasonable amount of time. Okay, P space is the class of all the pro problems that a com conventional computer could solve using a reasonable amount of memory but possibly an unreasonable, astronomical mm -hmm. amount of time. Okay, so currently um, uh, P is a subset of P space. Okay, because uh, if you can only use uh, you know, a, a limited uh, uh, amount of, of time, well then you can also only use a limited amount of memory. Okay, because you know, just to access each cell of the memory takes some mm -hmm. amount of time. Right, but the other direction is far from clear. Okay, so because it may be that using only a small amount of space, you can do computations that involve reusing that same space over and over and over again that would require vast amounts of time. Okay, now, unfortunately, no one can actually prove this p not equal to p space conjecture. That's a common uh, theme in complexity theory that you know we have these deep mathematical conjectures. We hope that someday, you know, the, uh, someone will be able to prove them, but, but uh, they haven't yet. Well, suppose you could. Okay. What, are, yes. what are the implications for time? Okay, well, uh, the, the implication is that actually time is very different than, uh, than space, in that, uh, uh, you know, a, a computation with limited time is really much, much more limited than a computation with limited space. Okay, now, to me, one of the most interesting... Because you can use space over and exactly, over again, exactly. And you can't use time over again. Exactly, yes. Now, you know, to me, one of the most interesting ways to sort of probe this distinction is to ask, what if we made time reusable? Mm. Okay, what would happen then? So this leads to the subject of time travel, okay? Uh, and in particular, time travel into the past. Okay, so, you know, philosophers, science fiction fans have been interested in this sort of thing for a long time. Uh, uh, you know, and, um, you know, on a normal uh, telling, you know, the main thing you'd have to worry about, you know, if you had time travel into the past is uh, what's called the grandfather paradox. Okay, so this is where the story where you go back in time, you kill your grandfather, you know, so then you're never born, but then if you're never born, then your grandfather was alive, and so then, what, you know, what gives, right? So, uh, uh, you know, so we, we don't know, you know, modern physics can't say whether or not time travel into the past is possible or not, but most people say, you know, if it was possible, then, you know, the problem, you, you, you would run into these severe logical problems, you know, like epitomized by the grandfather paradox. Okay, now, actually, the, the interesting point is that there are actually a very elegant ways to get out of the grandfather paradox that have been known for several decades. You know, maybe one of the most elegant is due to uh, uh, David Doyle. Uh, the physicist, uh, he says that um, you know as soon as you go to a, a quantum mechanical description, then actually there, you can always tell some consistent story that avoids a grandfather paradox. So, for example, uh, the story could be you're you're born with probability half. Okay, if you're born, you go back in time and kill your grandfather, from which we conclude that you're born with probability half. Everything is consistent. There's no paradox. Right, and quantum mechanics, of course, forces you to talk about these sorts of states where you could be half alive and half not alive. Right, and it gives you sort of a completely general way to resolve these sorts of contradictions. However, 
once you do that, a, a new problem arises, okay? And this is that although there's always, you know, this sort of consistent story that you can tell about time travel that will avoid the grandfather paradox, you know, it, it might be astronomically hard to find that consistent story, okay? So consider, you know, a, a scenario where you would go back in time and you would dictate Shakespeare's plays to him. Okay, you tell, you just give him Hamlet, give him Macbeth. He says, oh, thank you for saving me some time. Okay, he publishes the plays, then they come down to you, you give them to him. So now notice, unlike the grandfather paradox, this story is completely logically consistent, right? There's no contradiction here. Okay, and yet most people feel that there is some sort of paradox. Okay, I think it seems it, like nobody wrote the play. Exactly. So, you know, so the paradox, if there is one, is not one of logic. It's one of computational complexity. Okay, it's that nature is somehow performing this astronomically hard computation, if you like, that somehow Hamlet is getting written, yet no one is ever doing the work of writing it. Okay, and, you know, this is very strange. And I think this is the, you know, the biggest conceptual difficulty, in some sense, that we'd have to contend with in a world that had closed time-like curves. And in fact, uh, uh, in recent work by uh, myself and John Watrous, we were able to prove that if you had closed time-like curves, then you could solve the prob class of problems that you could solve efficiently. Then would be exactly piecebase. Okay, the class of problems solvable by a conventional computer with a reasonable amount of memory. So, in other words, closed time-like curves would essentially make time equivalent to space as a computational resource.